Hari Om and good evening to everyone. On this beautiful day, 29th of July, we are doing our day 28th and beginning our chapter 28th too. Today's chapter, the new chapter, is called Gayatri Mantra. Amongst Hindus, there were a few things which were of most importance. To know what is the meaning of Om is one of them. And the other, amongst others, is to know the Gayatri Mantra. And thus, this is what we are going to do. Know both the things. In the last chapter, we saw that Japa Yoga was not only one of the four, but the fifth yoga. And in Bhagavad Gita, Shri Krishna says that amongst yoga, I am Japa Yoga. Similarly, you will see that in this following chapter, Shri Krishna also says that among mantras, I am Gayatri. It is that important. So let us begin this auspicious lesson with auspicious prayers. Samastha Jana Kalyani Niratam Karunamayam Namami Chinmayam Devam Sadgurum Brahma Vidvaram Om Sahana Vadaku Sahana Bhunaptu Sahabiriam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadhita Mastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Chapter 28 Gayatri Mantra Mantras are given out by the seers. <coughs> Rishis are the seers of the mantras, meaning they are the men of wisdom who had realized the deep significance and the pregnant impulse of the mantra. Every mantra has a presiding date. The belief is that when one chants a mantra, one is to do so keeping in one's mind the form of the deity. <coughs> then, like one being called by one's own name answers to it readily, so to hear the devata is invoked easily. For example, if a group of people are going and if I just call, Oh, bhai sahab, some may turn or some may not even turn. But if my mind is clear that I have to call for one, Ghansham, only Ghanasham will turn. It's a direct connection. Therefore, by before the mantra, you have to get that deity in mind. Actually, the word mantra are given out. So, do you explain to us? Sure. We know that the knowledge that has been given to our rishis also is called Aparavitya. That means the knowledge which is not of human origin believed to be given by gods. And it was this rishis, this seer scientist, who were clear in their thoughts and purest in their minds, who received this knowledge directly and they converted into, or in a sense translated into a particular form. And this form was known as mantra. Later, of course, the mantras were explained. So, these mantras were given out in the sense from that vidya which they received in the highest state of knowledge which was not in the communication of language. The masters, the seers converted them into a language form and gave, gave it out for the benefit of the generations. Yes, for you and me it would be more like sounds than actual language. We move ahead. That is the faith. It is also believed that on chanting any mantra 10,000 times alone can one hope to see any benign influence of the japa on ourselves. Whenever japa is undertaken, the form of the devata is to be maintained in the front of the mind's eye. 
to facilitate this we have a meditation stanza dhyana shloka that describes that devata associated with every mantra meaning every mantra has a particular prelog mantra called as dhyana shloka that means every deity is associated with a particular form and in order to explain that form and give the due praise to that form a particular special mantra was there which was only for that particular form and this would be found in the beginning of all scriptural texts which were there for example bhagavad gita it's so beautifully said iti dhyanam पार्थाय प्रतिबोधिता भगवता नारायणे न स्वयं व्हाट इट मींस फॉर द बेनिफिट ऑफ पार्थ पार्थ अर्जुन अर्जुन फॉर द बेनिफिट ऑफ अर्जुन भगवान नारायण हिमसेल्फ गिव व्हाट व्यासेन ग्रथितां पुराण मुनिना madhye mahabharatam that which the rishi the creator of all the puranas ved vyas vyasena grathita bhagwan ved vyas bhagwan ved why what did he give advaita amrita varshini bhagavati ashtadasha adhyayini उट एनी रिस्ट्री in that manner bhagwan gave 18 chapters 18 chapters to arjuna for the benefit of arjuna so that he enlightens himself and he does what his dharma has to be done in the middle of the mahabharata where in the madhya of mahabharata now see the moment we sang this entire few words of the dhyana shloka what happened our minds were transported yes. straight away to the place where we are supposed to focus what bhagwan yogeshwar arjuna vedavyas so the knowledge becomes sharper in our mind so all the characters the forms who gave to whom it was written by whom where it was and what it was everything is told in that one prayer or one shloka so these shlokas were known as dhyan shloka and they were there in the beginning of every scriptural book particular book. for the benefit of the sadhak so that our mind is focused so we know what we are going to read now what is our subject <laughs> going ahead some insist upon the ritualistic formalities prescribed in the upasana section of vedas as unavoidable the orthodox believe that as the japa numbers mount up higher and higher <coughs> homa tarpana last scale feed in and such other sacred acts are to be performed as the limbs of japa yoga tarpana means offering oblations and especially water to the manes to the departed souls to the fathers forefathers and home is of course yeah home means we know that sacrificial fire the prayers large feeding also we know in india from time immemorial we had understood this that one of the best ways of helping others and making dana so that you get purified in your heart and mind was to give anna dana food as dana so large scale feeding this is why in indian weddings even today we have hundreds of people coming not only that like many people also as charity prefer and like to give donations of food also for the poor people. so this is what it means over here that uh, there are of course the orthodox and not so orthodox people also the orthodox people might feel that the rituals also are very important so that the japa yoga becomes more and more powerful, powerful. going ahead 
This view is not universally accepted as there is another powerful school who believe that the sincerity and faith are the core to the japa sadhana and anyone with a chaste heart of love can faithfully do japa. He needs no such formal ritualistic entanglements to fulfill his sacred vow. So, it does not mean that the Karma Kandi and the Vedantis are fighting amongst themselves. No. We have already read before, we have understood now. As the person's personality, Hinduism gives them the path to move ahead accordingly. So, the Jnani or the Vedantis, they don't follow all the other aspects, but they do understand the importance of Japa Yoga. I think over here, I will just very quickly remind you the source consciousness from where knowledge came. This knowledge, <coughs> the Aparavidya was translated into Paravidya and Aparavidya Bhota, which was there in the Vedas. Vedas, we have seen that there is scriptural knowledge also and secular knowledge also. So, secular knowledge is called Aparavidya and scriptural knowledge is called Paravidya. Para, that which can be transcended. By that knowledge which you can reach the end of it. The worldly knowledge you cannot end. There is no end to the worldly knowledge. But the knowledge of consciousness, the spirituality, there is an end. Para, that's why you can cross that knowledge. Correct. And this knowledge was in our Vedas and the Vedas we have seen were divided into three sections. We have already done this before but a quick reminder to you also. The first part was Mantras, the second was Brahmanas and the third was the Upanishads. The first two parts were known as the ritualistic portion or Karma Kam. And the second, the Upanishad or the philosophical part, the understanding part was known as the Jnana Kam. So this is the distinction over there. And that is why the first two were the orthodox or who believed more in rituals and the second who believed more in the philosophy or understanding. Of it. So and the last word of this uh, paragraph Rashi, the sacred <coughs> vow. So for the orthodox, the sacred vow was waking up every single day at before the sunrise, bathing, then doing their sandhya. Sandhya does not mean evening alone, sandhya means the rituals that they have to perform. And along that, then the Japa was a part of it. Along with that, the other Tarpana and the Homa and feeding people every single day was a part. This was their Vau. Vau means they are Prana. Similarly, the Vedantis, those who follow the Jnana Yoga, they also take a Vau. That every day when they wake up early, they take the bath and they sit for their Dhyana. Just before the Dhyana, they do the Japa. Because they will speak about how much to do, what to do, how to do, everything. Also, the Japas were essentially divided into two types. One was the Puranic uh, Japa, which came from the Puranas, which were of the forms of the deities. Yes. And the earlier ones were? Were the Vedantic or the Vedic, Vedic, Vedic Mantras. Which were not of forms. Yeah. So, these were the two and you could choose any of the Japa, even of your Ishta Devata. Yes. So, it is in chapter which explanation is required. Mm -hmm. So, you must understand and then we move ahead. Shall we move ahead, Raj? There are three types of mantras. Those that invoke the lower powers of, nat of nature, tamasik. Those that excite the manifest and manifest might and power, rajasik. And lastly, those that are of the quiet and purely spiritual type, sattvic. So, very quick understanding. There is no such thing as negative mantra or any, I'll put a negative mantra or somebody, that's why Thomas said. No. Every mantra has its own power and is used for a particular purpose. And as far as we all are concerned, we will only talk about the, the spiritual mantra or the spiritual. Because our goal is spiritual enlightenment. Okay. To reaching the highest that as human we could reach. All those mantras can gain, again fall under two classification. A. Those that need to be only chanted and there is no need for one to know their meaning. And B. Those mantras that are of the nature of an invocation. And the devotee must necessarily know the meaning of those mantras without which he will not be able to bring 
his mind to play upon the divine theme constantly. So naturally we belong to the second aspect. The previous aspect is if you have sat into mantra, into homa or sacrificial fire, you may have heard the, the Purohit, the Pandit, the Purohit taking a lot of different words. Phat, ki, um, re. All these words are there which there you don't need to understand. They are to be pronounced in that way. Therefore, we are only focused on those mantras whereby when we chant the mantra, we need to understand. Shall we go ahead? Yeah. Yes. The Vedic mantras are both in the poetry and in prose. The metrical matras are called, mantra. uh, sorry, mantras are called Rup. And the prose ma mantras are called Yajus. Of all the mantras, the most powerful and the significant one is the single syllable incantation called Pranava. This is the Om. Get ready. Now Gurudev is going to speak of Pranava. Om. Why Om is so well known in entire universe, especially in the Hindu households. So what is the glory and the power of man mantra Om? And what is Om? So let us understand this very clearly. I'll read that paragraph once again and I'll continue reading. Of all mantras, the most powerful and the significant one is the single syllable incantation called the Pranava. This is the Om. The available literature upon the significance of this Vedic mantra is voluminous. Nowhere in the world can we meet with a more sacred symbol that has got such a vast amount of significance. From Vedic times until the present day, the word Om has been taken as a symbol and as an aid to meditation by spiritual aspirants. It is accepted both as one with Brahman and as the medium, the Logos, connecting man and God. Logos, the word. The entire history of the syllable is in the revelations of the Vedas and in the declaration of the Upanishad. That means the entire Vedas, the entire Upanishads are only explaining what Om is, the reality of Om. Or in other words, Om is everything. Om is everything. And, in, and his, in this history in the hands of the later philosophers developed into what came to be known as the Spotavada, the philosophy of the world. The perceptible universe is the form behind which stands the eternal, inexpressible, inexpress the Spota, manifested as the Logos or world. This eternal Spota, the essential material basis of all ideas or names is the power through which God created the entire universe. Means what Rajkri? Means Gurudev is giving out the theory of creation. How first there was the consciousness, the God, the Supreme and from that came what is called the verb or Om, the incantation, the sound. And from there, then came what is known as the Sporta Pada. Pada means discussion also about it. But what it was that, that, that is how the world started getting created from the Sporta. And philosophy of the world has started then. It is not yesterday somebody's mind thought, ah, this should be spoken like that, so we have spoken. Therefore, People keep asking so many spiritual masters, like science, why does religion does not keep changing or spirituality doesn't change? With time, everything should be renewed. <laughs> With time, everything will be renewed that, that which is incomplete, which new research is required. As we said before, it is paravitya. It is a complete knowledge. So it doesn't need to be renewed, it needs to be studied. And by the study, we need to reach the goal. You are saying something, right? 
I will go ahead. <clears throat> Ishvara, the Brahman conditioned by Maya. Now we know these words, Ishvara and Maya. First manifest its himself as the spotter, the inexpressible word of which out of which the inexpressible word out of which he evolves as the concrete sensible world. So from the subtle, which is exceedingly subtle, comes the gross. Earlier also we have seen, now you can start making the connections with what you are reading. You can also take the help of many of the diagrams, go back and see the diagrams and see how they connect with all of this that we are reading. We must, because when you will refer to the diagrams, you will realize, ah, that is why Ishwara comes there. Why Brahman is on the top? Then why is Ishwara slightly lower? What does it mean? Between Brahman and Ishwar, what is the thing? That is the sporter. So this is beautifully explained. There is a verse in the Vedas. Prajapati vai idam agra asi. It means, in the beginning was Prajapati, the Brahman. Tasyava dvaitiya as asi. Next to him was the word. Vagvai Paramam Brahma and the word was verily the supreme Brahma. The idea belongs to Hinduism and in the fourth gospel of the New Testament we read it. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. This is the gospel of Christianity, the testament, the New Testament. They have the same four words which has been spoken in our Vedas. This sporter has its symbol in the word Om. Thus, the Maitrayana Upanishad, after it has been said that there is one Brahman without words and a second, a word Brahman. We are told that the word is the syllable Om. The sound of Om is also called Pranava, meaning that it is something that pervades life or runs through Prana or breath. So Pranava is that which is running through our Prana and that is Om. And we have now understood this that what is formless and subtle and then how it manifests into gross and which also has a form. The very central theme of Mandukya Upanishad <coughs> is the syllable Om, through which the mysteries of Brahman is gathered to a point. The text of this Upanishad first treats Om in terms of the Upanishadic doctrine of the three states of waking, dream and sleep, but then passes on to the fourth, Turiya. Turiya is a short form word for Chaturya. Chaturya means the fourth. Thus transporting us beyond the typical Upanishadic sphere into that of the later classical Advait Vedanta. Speaking of Om, Taitri Upanishad, Upanishad says, Thou art the sheath of Brahman. And the mantra says, Brahmana kosho si medhaya pihitaha shutam me gopaya. So beautiful that you are the sheath, the covering. Remember, Raji, the sheaths that we had spoken of, the five sheaths, how each sheath covers the other. That means the outing, outer covering is an indication of the reality which is inside. <clears throat> that is, Om is the container of the Supreme and therefore invoking Om is invoking Supreme. <coughs> With this also you can understand why it is so important just to have Om. Even you have just Om or if you just say Om or Hari Om, that means you are actually remembering your true inner self, that creator, that Brahman, it is so significant. And now we have also understood that earlier we were only introduced to the three states. 
the waking, the dreaming and the deep sleep state. Now we know that there is a fourth state which is known as Turiya. In that Turiya is the short form of Chaturiya that is fourth. And Om also represents that state, Turiya. In in every piece of music, there are three aspects, namely the meaning of the song, the law of music and the sound of the song. Similarly, in Om, there are three aspects. The first is the mere sound, the mere mantra as pronounced by the mouth. The second is the meaning of the syllable, which is to be realized through feelings. And the third is the application of Om to our character, singing it in our acts and so through our lives. Gurudev has said your, your, I have said our, our, because it has to be to us. Om represents the self, which is the supreme non-dual reality. The self is known in four states, namely the waking state, the dream, the sleep, deep sleep, and the fourth state called Turiya. All these states are represented in the three sounds of Om, namely A, U, M. So whenever there is in English A, U and M, we will use the pronunciation of it and not say A, U and M. We will say A, U and M. And the silence that follows and surrounds the syllable. So it is just not Om, 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 Om. No, it is Om. So we have seen that in Om, when we think of Om, what we think of? Om, when I see, there is a sound also. Om, when I see, I see the form, symbol the symbol also. also. Isn't it? And the third is the silent, which is the meaning of Om or the application of that meaning into your own lives. And a, u, and ma of om is representing each of the states which is there. And the sheath of om is the covering the whole of the turiya, or turiya is like that sheath of om which is covering all the three states. The sound a represents the waking state, the sound u represents the dream state, and the sound ma or hmm represents the deep sleep state. The waking state is superimposed on the a uh, sound because it is the first of the three states of consciousness. And so is the sound a uh, the very first letter of the alphabet in all languages. All languages start with the word a. Uh. No one starts with b. <laughs> yes. In Sanskrit, it is so beautifully done. Look at my face. Whenever we say a, uh, this is the first natural sound that comes from our body. Uh, for that we don't have to do anything to our mouth. It just comes. But even to use the next, for example in English to say a, a, we have to make some facial movement. Some muscles have to be moved. So a is not the first sound. Uh, that's right. A, uh, a. Ah. This is how it goes. A uh is the first sound in all languages. In all languages of the earth. All languages. A uh is the first syllable in the now waking state. It represents the waking state. The dream is but a view between the mind of the impressions that had reflected on the surface of the mental lake during the waking state. Besides, the dream state occurs between the waking and the deep sleep state and comes second amongst the three states of consciousness. And so, U being next to A in order of the sound and also as it is between A and A and M, mm, it is treated as representing a dream state. What is a dream? It's a temporary phase. It is just between sleeping and waking, waking and sleeping, there is a dream state. So, so beautifully, the U sound is also in between yes. is between and it is representing the dream space. Yes. It cannot be more scientific. <laughs> so Just let me complete this. On the M sound, 
of om is superimposed the deep sleep state the comparison between the last sound of om and sleep is based on the fact that it is the closing sound of the syllable just as deep sleep is the final stage of the mind in rest we are not talking about just sleep deep sleep where you do not know anything else a short pregnant silence is superimposed the idea of the fourth state known as turiya this is the state of perfect bliss when the individual self recognizes its identity with the supreme there is so much more to speak and talk about om so lastly we have seen that ma is the final or representing the deep sleep state where the a uh, a mouth open and ma a mouth close so it makes a complete cycle opening and then closing the mouth also and the silence which is there in between every state is the tulya so from om <coughs> to om the silence is there that is the tulya so let us complete our Anjali. session over here today with prayers om asito ma satgamaya tamaso ma jyotir gamaya mrityor ma amrutam gamaya om purnamad पूर्णमिदं पूर्णात् पूर्णमुदच्छते पूर्णस्य पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवावशिष्यते ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नमः हरि ओम हरिओम हरिओम हरिओम